live from SABC Studios in Auckland Park, Johannesburg. Welcome to this week's second edition of The Watchdog. My name is William Voko, and on the show tonight... To have government's response to the crisis declared as having failed to respect, protect, promote and fulfil the rights contained in the Bill of Rights. Pressure never seen before is mounting on President Cyril Ramaphosa and his cabinet ministers, as well as ESCOM and the National Energy Regulator. My first guest is the leader of the official opposition who is on standby to talk about their part. We will also speak to briefed lawyers as well as legal analysts about a couple of lawsuits several political parties, labor unions and civic organizations are also pondering against ESCOM and the government. We will also touch on a government initiative that, though it's still being contemplated, insiders say is almost a certainty. If approved, it will bring some reprieve to the country's small and medium businesses that are under threat because of load shedding. All that's coming up in tonight's episode of The Watchdog, which starts right now. The official opposition, the Democratic Alliance, has instructed its lawyers to apply to the High Court for an interdict to stop the implementation of the new tariff hike. The National Energy Regulator last week caused an uproar after deciding to grant Power Utility ESCOM an 18.6% tariff increase for the 2023-2024 financial year and a further 12.74% for the 2024-2025. The DA wants the decision declared null and void. It appears the battle lines have been drawn. The DA says it will approach the courts to interdict the 18.65% tariff increase granted to ESCOM by NERSA. The decision by NERSA sent shockwaves across the country. Many say businesses and households that depend on ESCOM for electricity supply will suffer a huge blow. DA leader John Steinhazen says the time for writing letters and begging government to do its job has passed. The DA rejects this tariff increase by NERSA. We reject stage six load shedding and we reject government's poor response or rather their complete lack of response to the biggest crisis our country has faced in the history of our democracy. We have therefore instructed our lawyers to apply to the High Court of South Africa for the interdict against the implementation of the increase pending the following relief. Firstly, to have Nurse's decision of the 12th of January 2023 declared inconsistent with the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, to have it declared invalid and to have it set aside. Stienazen has also called on all South Africans to take up the fight against low shedding by joining the DA in its protest at ANC headquarters Lutuli House next week. Abongile Tumago, SABC News, Johannesburg. The DA leader, John Stenhazen, joins me on the line for more on what they plan to do next. Good evening, Mr. Stenhazen. Thanks very much for your time. Good evening, Boyer. Great to be with you again. If I suddenly go dark, it means that the load shedding set in, so let's hope uh, it lasts. It's been the story of, of our lives. Now, Stage 6 has been with us uh, for quite a while now. Um, did it have to take here uh, the NASA uh, decision to get you to, to take this step? Uh, no, uh, I think it's a compounding of a variety of factors. First of all, government's complete uh, lack of a, of a concrete plan to deal with it. Stage six and then the insult to injury, the ultimate salt in the wound, the massive hyperinflationary increase where South Africans are unfairly being asked to pay more for less electricity. Uh, and I think that it has become now time for a line in the sand with the government to be drawn. We've been listening to the excuses since 2015, and it's very clear that there's a language that they don't understand, and it's time to speak to them in the, in the language they do understand. 
Now, uh, I mean, lack of a concrete plan, you say, is that what uh, you gathered yesterday from that meeting that the president had with um, you as leaders of political parties represented in parliament? Well, it's the same old plan from last year that's just been reheated. The same plan that there was no action given to. We were told a whole lot of things were going to happen. Well, Eskim remains consolidated and not uh, unbundled. Uh, we haven't separated our generation from supply. Uh, industry experts' input uh, has been completely ignored. Uh, and the president has now chosen to put Eskim in the hands of Mr. Mantashe, uh, the very obstacle to energy reform. So it's very clear uh, that government has no real intention of dealing with the problem, or certainly doesn't have the will or the ability to do so. And they're going to have to be forced into a position where they discharge their basic responsibility as a government. Did you or any other leader for that matter ask the president yesterday as to why the much talked about unbundling still hasn't happened? Well, we keep hearing the same excuses that, you know, there's this happening, there's that happening. It doesn't happen. And frankly, you know, the time for these tick box exercise meetings and talk shops is over because you keep being told the same old story, but once the meeting ends, there's no action given to any of those things. And whether it's the industry experts that have been advising government, whether it's ESKIM itself, uh, whether it's the board members who appeared before SCOPA, um, it is very clear that there is a political problem here that's not being resolved. But did, any, but did anyone ask yesterday, and uh, I'm asking because that's what South Africans, you know, um, have been saying all over the social media. People are saying, but we've had this story over and over again. Um, hence, they don't, many don't think that uh, there's going to be any change I mean, this time around. Instead, the situation is going to get worse instead of uh, getting better. Hence, I'm asking whether you as the people who are privileged enough, unlike the rest of us, to, to have an audience with the president, you got any explanation as to why things went moving? Well, Voyo, I wasn't able to attend the meeting because we had stage six load shedding and we were in the midst of our four-hour one. But I did follow up with uh, leaders who did attend and I got the documentation that was presented, which is why I know it's the same old plan. And certainly on the timeline that the president presented to that particular meeting, it's got us suffering from load shedding all the way into post-2024 uh, with very little... Uh, you know, respite coming to us over the next, uh, certainly the short to medium term. Um, it, it's the same. It's the same old story. I'm still waiting for my one-on-one -on -one meeting with the president, where I intend to put that question to him directly. So far, all I've received is a rather rude and mealy-mouthed response from his office, um, you know, which I thought was quite dismissive, and certainly uh, not in the line of a social social compact or working together to try and solve the problem, which is why I, we've made a decision now that it's very clear that the time for talking is over and the time for sending letters and parliamentary niceties is over. It's time to take to the streets and to take to the courts. And that is what the course of action that I've outlined over the last 48 hours uh, of our party will be. Just before we get there, I mean, I'm keen to know, I'm sure South Africans are too, uh, what um, the president's office had to say to you. Well, he basically sent a very dismissive response. I asked him for a meeting. I said, I'd like to meet with him to discuss um, the, the problems. Well, there we go. You've lost me to the load shedding, I'm afraid. Um, so we asked to, to see what the, what the problems were um, and to be able to put on the table some solutions. And I got a well you know, don't call us, we'll call you a uh, tough response, which I thought was very unhelpful given the, um, you know, given the, the situation. Uh, from what you were then able to gather from, you know, other leaders, what then would have been or was the point of yesterday's meeting exactly? It's a usual tick box exercise that we saw, particularly during COVID, where the president's got to look like he's doing something. And I apologize for the darkness, but uh, this is the reality of many South Africans. And mm. unfortunately, Mrs. DeLille hasn't put a generator in my home like she's done for the ministers and members of the executive. Um, the, it's a usual tick box exercise to look like you're consulting, 
but actually don't listen to anything that people are saying. It's a repeat of what we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic, where the president calls a meeting, the opposition put viewpoints on the table, put suggestions on the table, and they then quietly just get pushed aside and uh, they carry on regardless. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very clear that that um, is, is what this is about. And that's the so-called consultations with others. And that's why there's absolutely nothing new when it comes to the situation um, relating to what the president's telling business. And it's why all these other meetings are being called off suddenly. And it's also why Mr. Dorator and Eskom are being summoned to the ANC Parliamentary Caucus to uh, you know, help them find a political solution for what is a, clearly going to become an electoral problem for the ANC. Now that you have mentioned him, what do you think um, of, his, of his performance and uh, the situation we, versus the situation we're in right now? Director, that. Uh, well, performance, the director's performance. Well, I think that he is in an impossible situation. And I've said it many times uh, on your station as well, that it doesn't matter who's put in charge of Eskom, whether it's uh, Warren Buffett, Jack Ma, uh, Elon Musk. The model is, ro is broken. The model is wrong. It is a... Uh, outmoded model that most of the world has moved away from, uh, and yet we're desperately clinging to it. So it doesn't matter who Mr. Dorator's replacement is, they're going to suffer from the same constraints that uh, they've suffered, uh, that Mr. Dorator and others have suffered on. I don't think that we've made progress, and I think that it's very convenient for government and particularly the ANC to blame Mr. Dorator and Eskom for the problem when, in fact, it's very clear we have a policy problem. It's very clear we have an ideological problem. And it's very clear we have a political problem. Eskom can't solve those. Uh, that's going to have to be solved in a different arena. You're taking to the streets. You're taking to the courts. The point of going to or marching on um, the ANC? Well, I think it's very important, as I've just said, that you locate the problem where it exists. The reason ESCOM is in crisis is because of the deployment of cadres that took place from the Tuli House, from the dirty contracts and tenders that were issued around Madupi and Kusile and involving Chancellor House, from the Tuli House, from the ideological and policy decisions that are made to cling to this outmoded ideology uh, of state control and crowding out the public sector and refusing to allow private sector involvement. Uh, is taken at the ANC headquarters. So we must locate the problem uh, where it belongs. The Tuli House is the scene of the crime for why we have the problem with load shedding in South Africa today. And we must not allow this government to simply shift responsibility and for the ANC to shift responsibility and blame Dorator, Eskom, the board, uh, the employees there, when in fact the broader problem, as I think was highlighted quite clearly by one of the board members when she appeared before Scopa, is the fact that we have a policy problem and a political problem. So we must locate the problem uh, where it emanates from if we are going to ab be able to solve it. Of course, yeah, I mean, you would have seen, um, I mean, the only or the one leader um, who had an opinion on this, Julius Malema, not necessarily saying you're barking at the wrong tree, but um, suggesting that uh, perhaps you should have done or you should be doing this differently. Go to the union buildings. That's where the power is and not at Lutuli House. Well, here's the thing. Mr. Malema must do what he feels is best. He's a leader of his party. I'm the leader of mine. And the clear call I've said, if you don't want to join the march, that's fine. But for goodness sake, do something, because we cannot sit around in the darkness while our businesses are folding, while people are being pushed into the unemployment queue and just sit around doing nothing. So if Mr. Malema thinks the union buildings are a better idea, well, I hope the EFF plans a march and let us know when it's happening. And that's why we're calling on all citizens uh, across the country, uh, whether that's CBOs, NGOs, other political parties, ordinary citizens, join the march, don't join the march, but let's do something to show this government that we are not going to take this anymore and we certainly aren't going to pay the premium for their corruption, their maladministration, their K-deployment and their terrible policy choices over the last decade. Now, to the matter you are taking to court, I mean, you would have seen um, the, the NASA 
guys last week at Payne's trying to explain their decision and uh, how they had to do what their mandate and their processes and procedures um, allow them or compels them rather um, to do under these circumstances and that the 18.65% tariff increase that they granted to ASCOM was not because it was something they would want to do but given the, the, the facts in front of them uh, and what they have to consider when taking such a decision, this was the only way uh, they, could, they could go. Well, we fundamentally disagree with that. And we believe there are a number of mechanisms that could have been put in place before this was simply passed on to consumers. Let's start with the fact that Eskom itself is 66% overstaffed. There's been no rationalization of non-core essential staff. Secondly, they could have started uh, with cancelling the corrupt mafia-style coal contracts, which involve huge amounts of money being paid for substandard coal, where there could have been massive uh, savings uh, granted. Eskom could have cut out uh, the corruption and maladministration in its own ranks. I don't think it's fair that all of these problems are simply just passed on to consumers. And the reality, Vuyo, is coming out of a hard lockdown, coming out of the post-COVID pandemic time, coming out from an economy that's not growing, South Africans just cannot afford it. Uh, NURSA may will South Africans to pay 18.5% before any municipalities have put on their uh, tariff increases for the year. But the reality is our citizens just cannot afford it. And this really is going to be the final uh, push that's going to push many, many South Africans below the surface. Uh, and who are already suffering and struggling to put food on the table or keep their business doors open, this is going to be the final straw for them. And I don't think we should just go gently into that good night. I think that as South Africans, we should rage and we should rage against the right people. And that is the government. Uh, two quick ones. Um, when do you intend filing, if you haven't done so um, already? And are you approaching the court uh, on, an agency, on an urgent basis? Uh, it will be an urgent interdict that sort because we want to prevent um, the tariff increase from being proceeded with and simply factored in. We think it is important to get clarity on that. Um, the papers are with me this evening. Our attorneys have finished the drafting. Our senior counsel have finished the drafting. I will sign the affidavits tomorrow and they will then be submitted uh, to the High Court by close of business tomorrow. Um, again, this is differentiated from the other action that's been taken. Uh, They've written to government, giving them sort of the 23rd to give answers to a variety of questions to which we all know the answer, mm. um, you know, and, that, and that's fine. But the point I've made is that the time for writing letters and for, you know, begging this government to do what it should be doing is over. And we need to now get out there and make sure that our voices are heard and let them know where the power actually lies in this country, which is with the people of the country. Let me thank you very much for your time this evening. This is John Stenazen, the leader of the official opposition, the Democratic Alliance, who has just been load shared. Up next, we look at several lawsuits that the government and ESCOM could face uh, over, could also face over the next few weeks. A showdown is looming between the government, ASCOM, a number of, of the country's political parties, labor unions and civic groupings. Among the political parties who have decided to join forces are the United Democratic Movement, the Ingata Freedom Party and the Build One South Africa Movement. The Nation, National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa is also part of the initiative and so are some businesses, NGOs and civic organizations. Here's one of their lawyers, Sipile Mutilis. We have been approached by various clients um, in, from all nine provinces to assist and um, really make our government or the state accountable and transparent as to what is really happening in relation to power generation in this country. We do state that the state has a constitutional obligation uh, for power generation, transmission and delivery in this country. And we also outline the rights that have been violated by the state in its failure to, um, to, 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 to to meet its obligation, its constitutional obligation. Uh, we then also outline 
the demands that have been put forward by our clients who have instructed us to write a letter of demand. Um, for example, we demand that the clients have demanded that be transparency and accountability from the state setting out exact and clear plan as to how it is going to stop load shedding. Um, at this present moment, we're instructed by our clients that the state has not been forthcoming as to the steps that it is taking to ensure that load, sh load shedding stops with immediate effect and um, also be transparent as to what is it that will be done in future to ensure that no, no load shedding takes place and that they don't lose businesses. We know that some of our clients have permanently closed their businesses. Some of our clients have lost jobs. Some of our clients represent groups from different walks of lives who have been affected, severely affected by load shedding. Take a listen to what one of the leaders involved in this initiative, UDM leader Bandu Olomisa, had to say. South Africans of all persuasions are looking for an uninterrupted ele electricity supply. So as a result of that, when we discuss this with uh, other people, including uh, the senior council, Toby, we agreed that uh, there is a need to approach the, the, gov the government, but not through perhaps using uh, marches and sittings and territories, but let us remind the comrades in corruption that they have been given a mandate to improve the, the, the conditions of South Africans or the lives of South Africans. Part of that is that uh, they took a decision to improve ESCOM, thereby building two big plants. But those two big plants, after they have been completed, we, they seem to be to have not been a backup for for service or maintaining them, and as a result, those two uh, uh, institutional uh, uh, firm, firm, uh, those two agents are not delivering as expected. So what we are saying now is that the state must be reminded about its constitutional obligations. The state has not taken any reasonable measures to provide vulnerable uh, people or South Africans with adequate and reliable energy. Now to look at that initiative and uh, a couple of others that may well be um, in the pipeline, please welcome legal analyst, advocate Mudidi Mamanya. Uh, Morne Malan is from the organization uh, Solidarity. Good evening to both of you and uh, thank you very much for your time. If I may start with you, advocate Manya, just your thoughts around what um, uh, General Bantu Olomisa, the IFPs, uh, um, and um, the, the, the One South Africa movement are trying to do here? Yes, good evening, uh, we and your viewers. Look, I think, firstly, this, this is a reflection of our inability as a nation uh, to unite uh, around our common difficulty. But it also seems to be a reflection that part of our mechanics of our constitutional democracy are not working uh, when, when political parties represented in parliament uh, resort to uh, you know, extra parliamentary actions uh, to, to seek to get the attention of government. Uh, I, I, I have read that the president had called a meeting, I think last Sunday or so, and a number of political parties decided not to attend. Uh, but it also raises questions around the efficiency of some of the systems that we have, like Netflix, uh, because this is one of the forums where some, some of these issues that are raised ought to be discussed. So, so in a sense, it means uh, that we have some bit of a difficulty. Uh, if you know, our history comes from post uh, pre-1994, where we had engagements, uh, we had the government of national unity, 
We had a post government of national unity in some provinces. We had uh, opposing parties working together uh, for the good of uh, the people there. So I think that's the, the one part that is the challenge. Well, those, the those, main... well, those who attended um, uh, don't seem to think that it was, it was worth their while. Well, wh whether they think it was worth their while or not, but I, I suppose to a very great extent the nation benefited. Uh, the bottom line, though, is whether we're also going to engage the court to uh, uh, direct policy positions for government, and I think that's one of one, probably going to be one of the major challenges. But I think the bottom line is all of us are affected, and the question is, are we unable as a nation to come to the end with all the available mechanisms uh, to address the common problem that we have? To you answering that question, are we able to do that? Not, not let's answer the very question you posed. Well, definitely in the circumstances we are unable. And I think that's the point I was referring us back to the pre-1994 situation. But I'm also saying to you, we have structures and systems in place are we then saying they are dysfunctional or they, can no longer, they are no longer relevant to address our problems? So I think that's the question that we must answer. Um, Mornay, uh, what is your organization contemplating? Uh, yes, I think just uh, by manner of introduction, I think one has to be very realistic about what it is that uh, the courts are able to do. Um, the court, uh, you can't approach the court to do something that's impossible. You can't approach the court to uh, force structures that are incompetent to suddenly become competent. So you have to be realistic about what lies within the courts. Uh, the advocate's quite correct that uh, especially those parties that are represented in parliament already have a mandate of their own to keep the executive to account. So they actually already have various uh, powers of their own without having to approach the courts. From our side, we are looking uh, towards approaching the courts with uh, relatively low complexity, narrowly tailored forms of litigation, uh, which address very specific issues, um, but which nonetheless can you know, have a high impact and, as, and have a high probability of success as well. So one of those points uh, would be specifically to um, approach the courts with a PIA, um, a promotion of access to information application. Uh, in terms, uh, or with regard to NARSA and with regard to the um, private, produce, private producers of power, whether that be applications for licenses or applications for registration, or whether it be for uh, own use or to feed into the grid, the fact of the matter is that um, we don't know how many, how many uh, companies applied, how many individuals applied, and we don't know how long those applications took or what the bottlenecks in the current system are. Um, we do need more private production in South Africa. Uh, the future of energy in South Africa is a decentralized grid. Of course, that doesn't mean that ESCOM has to move to the side. I don't think there's any, uh, you know, nothing in the foreseeable future that suggests that ESCOM won't be part of the mix. Um, and then um, above and beyond the fire application, we're also looking at an application specifically tailored uh, towards feed-in tariffs and uh, wheeling tariffs. Once again, uh, you can't expect entrepreneurs in the private sector, if they don't know what, uh, what the tariffs are that they're going to receive or that they have to pay in order to form part of the grid, you can't expect them to make the huge capital investment if they can't price the risk. And uh, despite the fact that our president last year said that these two forms of uh, policies will be an integral part of our um, solutions going forward, NASHA still hasn't published any guidelines in this regard. And uh, whereas certain municipalities, isolated municipalities have uh, produced uh, certain figures, these are widely discouraging and it leaves a lot of the private sector completely in the dark in this regard. But, but then, I mean, uh, Mr. Malan, I mean, your first and uh, third points in particular seem to speak to the same issues that um, these, uh, the parties um, that have uh, declared they are going to court uh, are also raising. If you take access to information, for example, the group that consists of Mr. Maimane, uh, General Holomisa, Mr. Shabisa, and uh, your Numsas, and so on, saying, 
One of their biggest frustrations is access to information. They don't know how decisions were, were arrived at. And that's one of the issues that uh, um, they are raising. In fact, they are asking to be furnished with uh, information and they've given a deadline before, of course, approaching, approaching the courts. So it doesn't sound particularly different from what um, you, you, you're saying is your issue as well. Uh, yes, I think it depends on the kind of information that you are seeking to uh, obtain. Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, NASHA specifically does have does publish the reasons for all of the decisions. I believe they are um, forced to do so in terms of legislation and also in terms of the uh, administrative law. They have to uh, furnish those decisions whenever or furnish the reasons for the decisions whenever they do provide them. Uh, we're looking at specific issues. Uh, related to the amount of applications, related to the time to uh, um, process those applications and the reasons for why uh, those applications are taking so long to, to uh, come on board. And on the tariffs, I mean, uh, a similar argument could, uh, uh, could be made. I don't know if you listened to John Stianazen, the leader of the DA just now, um, who was, uh, I mean, they are going to court to challenge or to ask the court to set aside Nessa's um, decision until again. Um, they are furnished uh, with, uh, with, with more information. Of course, they are also, uh, I mean, demanding a whole host of, uh, of, of other things. But it's about tariffs and how they are hurting or they are going to hurt the consumer, how they are going to hurt um, small businesses. So there again, you, you know, you're not, at least on, at face value, you're not far off from, from, from one another. So why would you want to pursue your own um, um, I mean, court case or court cases. Yes, well, I suppose the devil's in the details here. Um, they do sound quite similar um, at face value. Uh, we're actually not looking to address the recent tariff decision. We're looking to address the uh, tariff paid to private producers who are looking to uh, feed energy back into the grid or feed electricity back into the grid. So, I mean, it's one thing to say that um, you know we should be paying less for electricity. I think that um, ESCOM's financial position, regardless of how um, bad it is for us, I think that um, the fact of the matter is that ESCOM, you know, despite the you know huge waste and uh, you know, fruitless spending, um, you have to take into account the current position that they're in, and in that case, uh, perhaps the the specific tariff increase can be justified, but we're looking to address the tariff paid uh, from either municipalities or ESCOM to uh, individuals pumping um, electricity back into the grid. Um, the matter of expensive electricity on the one hand is an issue definitely, um, but I think the larger crisis at the moment is the fact that we just don't have enough electricity. Uh, we need to keep the lights on in South Africa because that's exactly how we save those small businesses and uh, you know, save all the South Africans the, the grief of having to check an app every single day or sometimes multiple times a day just to know when uh, you're going to have power. Now, the threat of uh, court action advocate Manya is dependent on uh, the government and ESCOM um, responding or responding positively to a whole range of uh, or issues that uh, you, this, this grouping of uh, General Olomisa and, and other political leaders um, are, are, are raising. And um, one um, wonders, and it speaks, by the way, to what you raised right at the, at the beginning, which is what they say uh, are frustrations like they don't get the information. They don't get the kind of cooperation um, that they believe we all should have, um, should should have, uh, should have, should have gotten. But in your understanding of uh, you know those class actions, how do how do they how do they work? What 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 gets considered, and what makes a a a strong case? Yes, I think we should be. Therefore, and I think the, the questions that you have put to Mr. Milan does help to amplify some of the issues. You know, one of the things that I keep on hearing repeatedly is we don't have information. Mm -hmm. Now, we all know that we have a law 
that regulates access to information. Now, you would have to make a request for information, for access to information. It would have to be declined, uh, or you, you would be provided with the information, then you can make up your mind on what you want to do. If the information is not provided, you would ordinarily have to appeal and thereafter uh, compel uh, uh, the body, the organ of state, to provide that information. So I suppose that part of the threat might have to be subjected to that process, which is the process prescribed in law. So I don't necessarily think that you can write a letter, demand information, and give an organ of state seven days and say, if you don't, I'll go to court. There's a procedural step that you have to follow. But separately, the, the issue of the frustrations, for instance, are referred to the political parties represented in Parliament. I listened to uh, the chairperson of SCOPA, who's from the ISP, he gave quite an elaborate explanation of the work of SCOPA, including the work that they did on ESCOM. And I gathered a sense that the political parties in Parliament seem to be united, that there are deep-rooted problems at ESCOM, uh, which needs to be addressed. And I think there were two oversight visits. Now, it would be very curious uh, to understand how the ISP now thinks the whole problem is with the executive when they are part of the process of trying to ensure uh, that ESCOM gets uh, back on its feet. Mm. But you also must remember that there are things that might border on a poor management or bad policy decisions, but there are also issues that we all know, some of them have been the subject of court decisions. For instance, you know, ESCOM has tried to switch off electricity in a number of defaulting municipalities, and the court rejected uh, that approach of ESCOM. Uh, and we all know ESCOM is treated with a hectic uh, uh, bill from certain parts of the country where there's no payment. We now know, and I think the late Mr. Mabuza, who was the chair of ESCOM, had hinted at the, uh, the problems of sabotage. We now know that, uh, in fact, there are people who are doing things at ESCOM to damage uh, some of the turbines uh, and render some of the things uh, dysfunctional. So in a, in a, there's a series of issues that you will need to, to mitigate. But let me conclude on this part by saying that, you know, when you look at the rights that are contained in the letter, I'm not even sure whether they are actually correctly characterized. Uh, because, you know, when you say, you know, load shedding affects the right to education, I can tell you there are hundreds, if not thousands of schools which have no electricity at all, and they haven't had. Uh, since 1994, mm -hmm. there are many communities that have never had access to water at all, never mind clean water. And I'm not saying it doesn't affect those who have access, but I'm saying you, you're going to have to find yourself having to justify why it is a gross violation in respect of those who suffer limitations because of load shedding, as opposed to those who have no access because there's not even the basic infrastructure to provide uh, that kind of thing. Hence, I, I go back Buyo, to the point I made that it might as well be that we, as a nation, we are having difficulties, and no doubt a lot of the issues that are raised are valid issues. But I think how they are going to be processed is going to be a challenge. I can tell you now, you, we all know now, that uh, court is not a two-day process, and it might as well be that this legal action might commence now and be concluded in 10 years to come. A quick hypothetical one, uh, advocate. Let's say uh, that you know one of the chairperson of SCOPA, who's from the IFP and other MPs, stand up and say, "Look, um, we have been trying our best, and we kept on believing um, the president because he knows things that we don't know. We don't know what is happening uh, within that sort of crisis uh, committee." Um, for example, and there are things that, I mean, we, 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 we don't have oversight. All we can do is ask uh, questions when he appears before a parliament, um, but uh, we have very little way or uh, ways of interrogating what he actually says. And if you look at, which is the criticism that people have leveled at the, have been leveling at the president, that he has been saying this for a good few years now, but without uh, making a great deal of progress. So maybe the courts can actually compel them. Say, uh, when you said this three years ago, what did you base that on? What then uh, subsequently happened? And so on and so forth. Is, is that not something that would 
stand in court at least? Boyo, if you read the letter, you, you will understand that the, the complainants are saying this thing started way back in 2007. Mm. So we do have a historical uh, a problem. Mm. But I am not convinced, particularly around the political parties represented in parliament, that they don't have the means to hold the executive accountable. At you, I was time, narrowing it down. I was I was narrowing it down deliberately because I mean three years ago the president said we had done things that are going to um, ensure that you know load shedding is a thing of the past. So hence I'm saying is there is there no case to be made to say what did you base that on or were you did you lie to us or did someone lie to you you know and then. Let's say, Buyo, the president were to table the plans and the minutes of um, the war room. You remember, he, mm. as deputy president, he also chaired the war room. Mm. And on evaluation and assessment, he finds that these plans could have actually been wrong, or these plans could have backfired on implementation, mm. uh, or to, the circumstances may have changed when the plans were made. And the question would be, who are you going to hold culpable. You, you know, and I think one of the issues that I think we need to understand is it is one thing to say from the outside, Buyo is failing as an anchor on SABC, but it's another when Buyo is sitting there and, and doing the actual job. Mm -hmm. Hence, I am saying that I'm a bit amused, particularly by the IFP, whose member is the chairperson of SCOPA, who has had two oversight visits. And as I said, I listened to him on radio on one of the stations, and he was ably explaining the complexity of, of ESCOM. For instance, he was explaining one power station sits on a coal mine. He doesn't understand why uh, there are trucks transporting coal from one side to, to that particular power station. And I think he was explaining the extent of the criminality uh, that is involved in there. So I'm saying that, and I'm not by any means speaking for the government, I'm not even a government spokesperson, but I'm just saying realistically, we're going to have to take, and the court is going to have to take all these factors. It may as well be that the government communication is not enterprising. It may as well be that the, the president has not been uh, explaining as much as he should, but I'm not sure whether factually that would entail that uh, he has lied or he has not done what he's supposed mm. to do. I mean, we have had, I don't know how many boards thus far since 2007. Uh, I don't know how many commitments we have had. Even prior to him being president, uh, when he was deputy president, we have had this commitment. It clearly says there's something fundamentally wrong, mm. and that needs to be identified and corrected. Mr. Malan, what gives you confidence that uh, your um, uh, initiatives may just... Um, succeed, comparatively speaking, of course. Yes, look, I think that if you take too broad a picture of it and if you try to uh, deal with all the, um, you know, the um, top-level issues, it, the fact of the matter is no court can manifest a right. No court can uh, you know, pass a judgment and then suddenly, uh, instead of not having access to electricity, now we have access to electricity because a court told ESCOM or the government or whoever that may be uh, that they must suddenly deliver it. They cannot, the court simply doesn't have that kind of power. So our approach is to look at very specific risks, very specific issues, uh, which are a means to the end of achieving electric electricity state or energy sustainability. Uh, looking specifically at matters such as feeding tariffs, uh, matters such as wheeling tariffs, looking how we can find uh, ways in which to um, bring people onto the grid and compel uh, NASA to incentivize bringing people onto the grid. These are the kind of things that um, courts can do, and it's the kind of things that also alleviate the issues. And I don't think that uh, we should necessarily step into the trap of saying that uh, just because some individuals have never had uh, the opportunity to uh, enjoy a specific right that uh, you're not allowed to complain if the, if the right's being limited on the other side, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, more and more South Africans are being deprived of their human rights. And um, we're never going to solve everybody's issues if we can't solve some, you know, some people's issues. And um, you know, 
ESCOM needs to be stabilized on behalf of all South Africans. Uh, we need to develop the electricity grid, uh, you know, for every single South African, because you know, no matter who you are, um, we're all in the dark at the moment. Morning, Malan, Advocate Medina Let me thank both of you for coming on this evening. Thank you. Really um, appreciate it. Well, take a listen to what the governing party had to say today about the ongoing crisis. The conversation that the Office of the Secretary General will be leading in the next week, just at the back of what the President would have spoken about, will bring on board experts in the energy space who will be able to then guide us who will then be able to say to us, these are the practical steps that you need to be taking. These are the things that you need to do. We know that uh, uh, there is also the question of transitioning, which is again another area of interest as we are dealing with uh, issues of energy security as well. Say, so, okay, you can transition in this way, but you can still be able to attend to the issues of energy generation to the security of uh, energy supply to the general uh, citizens and populace in this way. Now, business owners say they are struggling to stay afloat amid the constant and crippling rolling blackouts. Now, one of the companies affected by the blackouts is the Soweto Creamery, which, as many of you may remember, was mentioned in the president's 2022 State of the Nation address. The company's founder used the COVID-19 uh, Relief of Stress grant to start the business. This afternoon, the Department of Small Business Development, uh, Minister Stella Ndabeni Abrams and her team uh, said they are trying to find solutions aimed at lessening the devastating impact of load shedding on small businesses. The department is in consultation with different stakeholders, they said, working on an energy relief package for small, medium, informal, and micro sectors. The details of the package, the criteria, and the avenues for the application for the relief will be announced soon. Well, we were hoping to speak to George Sibulela, who was going, who's the chairperson of the South African uh, United Business Confederation, to get him to react on this. But have a look at what uh, the owner of that creamery that the president spoke about last year had to say about the impact this load shedding has had in his business. Small businesses continue to bear the brunt of an inconsistent energy supply and heightened levels of load shedding, with some moving to cut their staff complement while others close shop. Tando Makubu saw the spotlight fall on his small ice cream business after getting recognition from President Cyril Ramaphosa in his 2022 State of the Nation address. The Social Relief of Distress Grant has provided support to more than 10 million unemployed people who were most vulnerable to the impact of the pandemic. Some people use the money to start businesses. Mr. Tando Makubu from Soweto received 350 grand for seven months last year and saved it to open an ice cream store that now employs four people. Makubu says he was hopeful that his business would have grown threefold by now, but load shedding continues to dash his dreams. Load shedding is a real issue for us, and as you know, we sell ice cream, and ice cream is a fragile product. It's, it needs to stay in the freezer all the time. If there's no electricity and if the freezer isn't working, it's going to be an issue. So we find ourselves uh, spending a lot of money running uh, the generator, to save our stock. Our plans as Isoeto Creamery was to branch out and our plans are still to branch out but then load shedding is slowing us down so it's going to take much longer for us to, to get where we want to get to. Makubu had four people working under him, his chief employee being his mother Bomisiwe Makubu who says it's heartbreaking to see load shedding destroying his son's business. 
The company invested in a generator but was forced to do away with some items on its menu due to the continuous blackouts. Load shedding is affecting in Lelemangazan. Load shedding has affected us in a big way. We can't stock the whole range of stock anymore because it goes off. Customers find stock messed up. We've tried to get a generator, but it's not easy because petrol is expensive. On New Year's, we didn't have power for four days and we spent over a thousand rand of profits on petrol. We've discontinued Oreos and waffles. It's a lot when government encourages people to create employment, but it's tough when there's load shedding like this. While the Soweto Creamery remains hopeful as a small enterprise buckling under pressure from the rolling blackouts, they still hope to grow into a formidable business and create well-needed jobs. They say that can only be possible if load shedding is stopped and small businesses are supported to pick up the pieces. Katlerolo Rodi, SABC News, Soweto. Well, George Sibulela is back um, on the line. George, good evening. Thanks very much uh, for your time. From what the statement that was sent out by the Minister of Small Businesses um, says, help um, may soon be given to businesses like the Soweto Creamery. Well, it's quite a very disturbing situation that we see in this country. A very, you know, we cry our beloved country. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a sad situation that we are experiencing today. We are in an inundated. We work day and night with a large number of companies that are coming and uh, raising these issues. And uh, I think we're running out of ideas. Uh, I, I'm very, really uh, excited to hear the Minister of Small Business saying this relief has to come to the fore. The sooner it comes in, and I don't know why it took so long, but the sooner it comes in, in making sure that these businesses are relieved. Same way as we had a current, we have uh, challenges, if you recall, on the demand management situation uh, uh, in, in number of years. Uh, when the government decided to take initiative to assist ESCOM on the consumption of energy by installing geysers in different homes in order to reduce the consumption, the, the demand that ESCOM was experiencing. I think we want to see government come into the fore and say uh, how much they can be able to assist uh, businesses in terms of that sustainability i know it's a it's a mammoth task because you can imagine the number of smmes that exist in this country mm. uh, it, it's not that easy we, we we need a solution at least to survive some of these businesses i mean we are sitting with a record of at least a minimum of over 600 companies that have been closed purely because they can't afford diesel they can afford fuel they can afford uh, uh, they can afford fuel they can afford uh, electricity and, and that that is a is a very worrying factor so well, if we can have a, a solution where probably to a certain extent we have uh, uh, inverters that are installed uh, are given to some of these small businesses for them maybe at least to be able to trade i mean you had the recent story of an ice cream, small ice cream business that says, we decided to stop. Not only because uh, we did not have a, a, a generator, but the cost of the diesel was quite high. Mm. And therefore- Well, well that's what, that's what the we, statement says, yeah. that many cannot afford alternative power sources, such as generators. They are forced to pause trading during load shedding. Uh, small businesses resort to selling perishable goods such as meat and vegetables at uh, low prices to avoid them, avoid them rotting away. And uh, it goes without saying that this eats away on their much needed income. But uh, from what I understand from the little bits and pieces I've been able to pick up since this um, statement came out a couple of hours ago, uh, you'll have restaurants maybe being assisted with like 
gas of some form or the other or how to you know source gas uh, others would need generators or, or 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 any other you know thing that may help uh, like but it's it's not it's going to be a tricky one one person told me um because there's a whole application process that uh, these businesses would have to go through but of course they did underscore the fact that during covid some of this happened so they are building on the experience uh, that they got uh, during 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 um, um, a COVID, I don't know if you are able to share any um, insights what your members had to go through during that time. That which perhaps would have to be, uh, you know, some of the things that may have to be avoided this time around if this thing is indeed going to work. You know, Vuyo, the impact of uh, this load shedding. It's a multiple uh, of, of number of issues. Uh, one, it takes a lot of amount of time for you to even reach your work destination. Robots are not working. You can imagine the cost of time. You arrive at the work, then the electricity is not available. You, you have to have, there are businesses that have to consistently have electricity, whether we like it or not. Secondly, Vuyo, the costs are enormous. It's more than what the SMME have budgeted for, other than just the cost of the, the, the stock that they have to sell. It's dark. There's no power. Uh, the, the systems that they use, electric, uh, technology system that they use is not functioning. You can imagine the frustration. So they have gone through a numerous, and, and it's, it's different challenges from different businesses. But the fact of the matter is the effect is being felt badly. Uh, and, and this is where you start to realize the impact of how much energy plays in, in businesses or in the economy of this country. Should we blame the government of this country? Really, at this point in time, I would say this is a country problem. It's not only an individual problem. It's not only an ESCOM problem. It's a, it's a problem of decisiveness, of leadership, and it's a problem of ensuring that we have the right people in the right positions. It's a problem of also making sure that uh, no government interference in some yeah. of this leadership is very critical. Some of these things are so critical. Okay. But we need to work together in the interest of the country to make sure that we deal with this issue in the interest of our, our beloved country. I think that's George, the most important. George Sibrella, thanks very much for your time at such short notice. Uh, thank you so much, really appreciate it. He's the chairperson of the South African United Business um, a Confederation, of course. I mean, there's a lot that uh, these businesses would have to comply with. The business would have to be registered, I'm told. It would have to be tax paying or compliant. Uh, it must have been in existence uh, for quite a while. I don't know what the period is going to be, but it must also be SA owned and located. That's our show for tonight. Do join us again tomorrow evening, same time. Have a good night.